So I see my videos on the poem of the man God have got people and discussions happening and, you know, very lively debate, which I find interesting. I just thought I would do a longer video um, from uh, for, uh, Dr. Mark Miravalle, who he did this document in 2006 on the poem of the man God, because I do think it takes it requires study. I really do think it requires study. People are saying, uh, no, it's demonic. It's this. And I'm saying, if it's demonic, show me the fruits. Where are the fruits? Has this poem caused a schism in the church? Not that I've seen. Is it cause, calling people? Uh, is it uh, pushing people outside the church? Church? Not that I've seen. If anything, from the dozens and dozens and dozens of emails I've received from people who have been profoundly impacted by the poem, it is doing something in their souls. And so, you know, it does. I I do think this work requires now more study. I mean, I was speaking to somebody today in this time of where we're consumed with television and media and so forth. And and in a time in the church when, you know, after Vatican II, where we've expanded our lectionary and we have more access to sacred scripture like we have ever had in, before in our lives. It's amazing how little people actually know about sacred scripture. If you think about it, there is no time in history when we have more access to sacred scripture than now. There are saints in the church. If you think of St. Teresa of Avila, she would never have been able to read the Bible end to end because she didn't know Latin. If you think about it. And, you know, and St. Teresa of Lisieux, I believe, never uh, read the Bible end to end. And now I stand corrected and people can correct me and please, please correct me. But during St. Teresa of Avila's life, they were rounding up the Spanish translation of the Bible. They weren't allowing people to actually read the Spanish translation of the Bible because of, of the, what Protestants were doing. And today we have ubiquitous access to the sacred scripture, ubiquitous access everywhere on our phones we can and yet so many people don't know about christ so many people haven't a clue about sacred scripture they haven't read it or they just think it's some some you know somebody says well why would i read sacred scripture sure it's like lord of the rings uh you know they don't understand what they don't know and, um, you know, with Maria Valtorta, there are so many documented uh, physical locations, towns, um, scenes that impossible for a woman to have invented, even with the most vivid imagination. Impossible, you know. And so anyway, you'll see this in this in this uh, document that I'm going to read out. But I do recommend people, if you want to know the Gospels, uh, better insight into the Gospels, read the poem of the man God. You know, there are so many biblical scholars that spend years and years and years studying, trying to piece together different elements in the in the in the poem of the man God. Uh, for example, or sorry, in, in scripture, for example, Christ's brothers, who were his brothers? Well, in the poem of the man God, it's very clear who his co brothers, his cousins are. You know, the it it's fascinating, truly fascinating piece of work. And uh, as you'll hear read, you know, it wasn't just Pope Pius the Twelfth that gave his approval, at least for the this first volume of of the of the poem. But you also have Pope Saint Paul the Sixth, who sent a letter on uh, to Father Ruschini, who published a four hundred page book on. Marie um on on Mary in the works of Maria Valtorta. So anyway, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. Listen to this. It's a very long thing. It's a very long um, expose. But uh, as I said, I'm fascinated by this work, like many others in the church. It is, it is for this time when we have denied sacred scripture, denied Christ's teachings. You know, but people don't believe. 
And yet we have this gift for this time. No doubt. No doubt. I wouldn't be surprised in 50 years if Maria Valtorta is is declared a saint and her writings are, are up there with them. Um, with the diary of saint faustina that is the level of 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 gold in her writings um, in my opinion but anyway it's private revelation and as the catechism says you know discernment is needed um, but i'd love to see the studies you know the the scientific studies from her work works because there is so much knowledge in there uh, and why would that be why would why would she have access to all of that if not for this work to be used in the church anyway have a listen to this god bless you take care bye bye i'm just going to read this um response to various questions that have been posed about the poem of the man god so this has been published in april 15 2006 by dr mark miravalle he's professor of theology and mariology at franciscan university of studentville and uh, so we'll just go through this because i thought it was very well prepared a lot of people have questions and as i said uh, here we're talking about private revelation so you're perfectly fine to disagree or agree um, you know none of you nobody is obliged to believe in private revelation but if our lord has something to say to us sometimes it's no harm uh, hearing what uh, our lord says in private revelation and the church does exist does exist um, acknowledge that uh, heaven uses this our Lord used this from time to time so anyway we just go through this poem of the man God which I found, find incredible and I have read 75% of it now so um, you know it's been it's been an incredible journey anyway the poem of the man God has been uh, published under the title of the gospel as revealed to me but it's the same book um Maria Valtorta was born in Caserta, Italy on March 14, 1897. Deeply pious, Maria was strongly attached to God from early childhood. But it was as a young woman she was started reporting mystical experiences. In 1920, she was randomly attacked by a young man who hit her in the back with an iron bar. Badly injured, she was forbidden, bedridden for three months and her health began to decline, gradually decline. In the years to follow, she made a personal offering of her sufferings to the two divine attributes of love and justice. And by April 1934, she was permanently confined to her bed. It was in 1943 that Mar that Valtorta began to write down in her notebooks the dictations, the mystical visions and messages she reported receiving from Jesus and Mary. And the years between 1943 and 1947 were the period of her greatest output. She wrote almost 15,000 pages of dictation, a little less than two-thirds of which comprised of the poem of the man-god, a substantial work on the life of Jesus Christ, beginning with the birth of Our Lady and ending with her assumption. Maria Valtorta died on October 12, 1961. In 1973, her remains were moved to Florence and entombed in the Capitular Chapel in the Grand Cloister of the Basilica of the Most Holy Annunciation in Florence. Interesting where she's buried. The following observations are offered towards the more accurate a more accurate understanding of the present church status of the poem of the man god there is no intention here to provide a comprehensive response to various objections which have been circulated some of which suggest that the present status of the poem is morally compar compat comparable to a forbidden book the desire here is simply to give an initial response to some of the most frequently asked questions and objections regarding the poem from ecclesiastical and theological perspectives. It has been objected that Pope Pius XII never gave approval for the poem of the man God since his approval was not printed in the February 
27th, 1948, of the Osservatorio Romano, which documented the papal audience of Pius XII with Father Migliora, Migliorini, Father Berti and Father Cechin, spiritual directors and custodians of the poem of the man-god. There is no substantial reason to doubt the oral statement granted by Pope Pius XII during the papal audience given to the spiritual director of Maria Valtorta, Father Romald Migliorini, OSM, Father Berti, OSM, and Father Andrea Cechin, prior of the Order of Servants of Mary. Papal audience, February 26th, 1948. Lo- Lovesovratore Romano, February 12th, February 27th, 1948. Whereby they record the words of the Pope saying, Publish this work as it is. There is no need to give an opinion about its origin, whether it is ox- extraordinary or not. Who reads it will understand. One hears of many visions and revelations. I would not say they are all authentic, but there are some of which it could be said that they are. End of quote. Speculations on how much was read by Pius XII or whether in whole or in part posed to undermine the oral statement of Pius XII as faithfully transmitted by the prior of the order of the servants of Mary, which represent speculation without factual foundation. 2. The objection has been posed that Father Bea, recognised Vatican scripture expert, only read part of the poem manuscript. Father Bayum Bea, who eventually became Cardinal Bea, rector of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, Vatican II father and chairman of several Vatican biblical commissions, offered his testimony that, as far as exegesis is concerned, I do I did not find any errors in the parts I examined. End quote. To infer from this statement that he failed to read the parts of the poem that do contain doctrinal or exegetical problems is again mere conjecture without factual foundation. 3. Doubt has been cast on whether or not one can licitly read the poem because it previously been placed on the index of forbidden books by the Holy Office. This is the same index that had the diary of St. Faustina on it. The placing of the poem on the index should not be connoted with a direct papal act by Pope John the Twenty Third. That the Holy Father was informed of the action would be an appropriate conclusion. That the Holy Father personally read, analysed and concluded to its need to be placed on the index would be on would be beyond evidence. Nonetheless, obedience to the decrees of the Holy Office in reference to forbidden books index, while the index was in existence, was required and should have been strictly observed. The issue of obedience and disobedience regarding the initial publication of the poem constitutes an entirely separate issue from the relevant theological issue and the inherent doctrinal integrity and orthodoxy of the poem text itself. 4. The dissolution of the Index of Forbidden Books in 1966 denotes a priori that there is no longer any book canonically forbidden by the Church to be read under penalty of disobedience. While books can be deemed doctrinally erroneous by the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, the index, the dissolution of the index by the Holy Office itself makes clear that there no longer remains any book the reading of which by members of the faith would in itself constitute an act of canonical or ecclesiastical disobedience. To conclude, therefore, the poem, the reading of the poem is to be disobedient to the church due to its previous placing on the index would be to inordinately put forward a restriction beyond the current restrictions which the magisterium in general, and the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in in specific have put forth. 5. The 1966 statement of the Holy Office that the index 
retains its moral force despite its dissolution may call the Catholic reader to special diligence and discernment in examining works previously found on the index. However, this should not be inappropriately extended to support a conclusion that reading any work previously placed on the index would still presently constitute a formal act of disobedience, as if an index of forbidden books was still in full operational existence and force. Similar reason could lead to the mistaken concept of continued moral binding force for books previously prohibited by competent ecclesiastical authorities and later fully exonerated, imprimatured and promulgated by ecclesiastical authorities. For example, of this, uh, an example of this is the prohibition of St. Faustina, Faustina Kowalska's diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul by ecclesiastical authorities, which was later granted imprimatur and full church approval. Six, the former Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict, has also been cited as personally condemning the poem. Cardinal Ratzinger's 1985 comment to a federal cardinal in a letter that speaks against the supernatural character of the literary forms of the poem was not in the canonical or ecclesiastical form of an official and universally binding degree of the congregation of the doctrine of faith nor did cardinal ratzinger in any way prohibit the reading of the poem it can be helpful to keep in mind that when the former cardinal ratzinger and the congregation of the doctrine of the faith did indeed examine a text which they concluded contained intrinsic doctrinal error they did not hesitate to issue when deemed appropriate and officially promulgated notification concerning the respective text due to its inherent doctrinal errors. No such notification has been issued by the post-conciliar CDF regarding the poem of the man God. A number of other posed objections against the poem appear lacking in serious theological foundation. One objection states that the lengthiness of the speeches of Jesus and Mary manifests evidence of a lack of authenticity. This objection cannot substantiate a conclusion of doctrinal error, but rather comprise of a very subjective and personal opinion as to the appropriate duration or lack thereof of the teachings of Jesus and the dialogues of Mary. Moreover, obje the objection posed that the poem makes reference to a sexual element of original sin and therefore is doctrinally erroneous also cannot be theologically substantiated. The Church has always permitted a significant diversity regarding concept of the nature of original sin committed by Adam and Eve and both St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas in fact held that the material element of original sin Peccatum originale materialiter included to some degree an aspect of concupiscence. Such theological opinions certainly does not indicate a doctrinal error, regardless of a legitimate difference of opinion concerning the potential element of sexuality in relation to the first sin of Adam and Eve. Yet a further objection of alleged doctrinal error is the reference found in the poem that Mary is the second born of the father after Jesus and that the father's first born far from constituting a doctrinal error. This Mariol Mariological position was first posited by the Eastern Church author John of Geometer in the 10th century. This remains an acceptable Mariological concept proximate to the Franciscan school of Mariology is complementary to the eternal predestination of Mary with Jesus in the Incarnation and is referred to by Blessed Pius IX in the papal statement defining the Immaculate Conception in a fabulous Deus. Deus. In addition to the extensious, extensive Mariological Mariology contained in the poem was also a subject of a 400 page study written by arguably the greatest Italian Mariologist of the 20th century and consultor to the Holy Office, Reverend Gabriele Roschini, OSM. In a letter of January 17, 1974, 
Father Ruschini received the congratulations of Pope Paul VI for his work entitled The Virgin Mary in the Writings of Maria Valtorta. This letter from the Secretary of State notes, The Holy Father thanks you over wholeheartedly for this New Testament of your respectful regards and wishes you to receive from your labour the consolation of abundant spiritual benefits. Neither the papal benediction granted by Paul VI nor the papal congratulations issued by the Secretary of State would have been granted to a text based on a series of private revelations which were forbidden or declared doctrinally erroneous by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. So there you have two popes, (laughs) Pope um, Pius XII, and Pope Paul VI. And that book is well worth reading. Uh, the, Vir- the Virgin Mary in the writings of Maria van Torta is, is simply incredible. In sum, the poem of the man called constitutes a text which may be licitly read and discerned by the contemporary faithful Catholic. I would invite interested Catholics to examine the poem for themselves while always retaining a determined commitment of obedience to the final and definitive judgment of the Church regarding these reported private revelations. I personally have found these writings to be particularly inspiring in bringing to greater light the li- and life the fathomless mysteries of the life of our incarnate God as contained in the ineffable and infallible word of God in the New Testament. The following documented evaluations may also be of assistance in an authentic and integral discernment and examination of the poem of the man-god. His, excellently, His Excellency Archbishop Alfonso Carnich Secretary of the Congregation of Sacred Rites in 1946. There is nothing therein which is contrary to the gospel. Rather, this work, a good complement to the gospel, contributes towards a better understanding of its meaning. Father Dreyfus of the French Biblical and Archaeological School of Jerusalem in 1986 I was greatly impressed on finding in Maria Valtorta's work the names of at least six or seven towns which are absent from the Old and New Testaments. These names are known but to a few specialists and through non-biblical resources. Now how they could have been known, she could have known these names if not through the revelations she claims to have had. Monsignore Ugo uh, Latanzi, Dean of the Faculty of Theology of the Lateral Bibli- uh, Pontifical University, advisor to the Holy Office, 1951. The author could not have written such an abundant amount of material without being under the influence of a supernatural power. Father Marco Giraudo, uh, Dominican commissioner of the holy office in 1961 to father bertie representing the order of the Servi- servants of mary 1961 you have our complete approval to continue the publication of this second edition of maria valtorta's poem of the man god father augustin bea future cardinal sj rector of the pontifical biblical institute and advisor to the holy office in 1952 I have read a typed, in typed manuscripts many of the w- w- books written by Maria Valtorta. As far as exegesis is concerned, I did not find any errors in the parts which I examined. Father Gabriele M. Roschini, OSM, Professor of the Marianium Pontifical Faculty of Theology in Rome, author of 130 books on Mary and advisor to the Holy Office, 1972. I must candidly admit that the Mariology found in Maria Valtorta's writings, whether published or not, has been for me a real discovery. No other Marian writing, not even the sum total of all the writings I have read and studied, were able to give me as clear, as lively 
as complete as luminous or as fascinating an image, both simple and sublime, of Mary, God's masterpiece. Dr. Victorio uh, Tredici, geologist and meteorologist, Italy, 1952. I wish to underline the author's inexplainably precise knowledge of Palestine in its uh, panoramic, uh, topographic, uh, geological and mineralogical aspects. His Excellency Bishop George H. Pierce, Archbishop Emeritus of Suva, Fiji, 1987. I first came into contact with the work of Maria Valtorta in 1979. I find it tremendously inspiring. It is impossible for me to imagine that anyone could read this tremendous work with an open mind and not be convinced that its author can be not one but the Holy Spirit of God. Venerable Father Gabriele Allegra OFM Father Gabriel Allegra of the Order of the Friars Minor was a missionary and biblical exegete of world renown, having translated the entire Bible into Chinese. Father Allegra died in Hong Kong in 1976. John Paul II declared Father Allegra venerable in December 15, 1994. The following are excerpts from his extended defence of the poem of the man-god entitled A Critique of Maria Valtorta's Poem of the Man-God. The visionary hearer usually begins by describing the location of the scene which she contemplates. She reports the chatter of the crowd and of the apostles and then, according to what she sees and hears, she describes the miracles, relates the discourses of the Lord and the dialogues of those present with him or with the disciples or the dialogues among themselves. This re-evoking of the life of Jesus its times and surroundings and its various aspects, physical, political, social, familial, is done without any effort. The writer reports what she has seen or heard. Her style does not resound with the erudition notable of the most famous lives of Jesus. It is rather the report of an eye and auricular witness. If Mary of Magdala or Joanna of Cusa had been able during their life to see what Maria Valtorta sees and had written it down, I believe their testimony would not differ much from the poem. Valtorta observed with much intensity the place and personages of her vision that anyone who has been to the Holy Land for studies or has repeatedly read the Gospels need make no excessive effort to reconstruct the scene. I repeat, It is a world brought back to life and the writer rules as if she possessed the genius of the writer rules as if she possessed the genius of Shakespeare or Manzoni. But with the works of these two great men, how many studies, how many vigils, how many meditations are required? Maria Valtorta, on the contrary, even though possessing a brilliant intelligence, a tenacious and ready memory, did not even finish her secondary education. She was, for years and years, afflicted by various maladies and confined to her bed, had few books, all of which stood on two shelves of her bookcase, did not read any of the great commentaries of the Bible, which could have justified or explained her surprisingly surprising scriptural culture, but just used the popular version of the Bible of Father Tinori OFM. And yet she wrote 10 volumes of the poem between 1943 and 1947 in four years. Striking details. We all know how much research scholars have done, especially Hebrew scholars, in designing various maps of the political geography of Palestine from the time of the Maccabees up to the resurrection of Bar Kokhba. For more than 70 years, there has they have had to consult a pile of documents, the Talmud, Flavius Joseph's inscriptions, folklore, um, ancient itineraries. And yet, the identification of a good many localities still remains uncertain. In the poem, though, whatever could be the judgment given about its origin, there is no uncertainty. 
At least four fifths of the cases, stu recent studies confirm the identification supposed in the poem, and the number would grow, I think, if some specialist would be willing to study this question deeply. Valdorta, for example, sees the forking of roads, landmarks which uh, indicate directions, various cultivations according to the different quality of terrain, so many Roman bridges. Th thrown across various rivers and streams, streams which are lively in certain seasons and dried in other. She notes the difference in pronunciation between the various inhabitants of different regions of Palestine and a mass of other things which complex the reader or at least make him thoughtful. There are a series of visions, visions in which the mystery of the birth of Jesus, his agony, his passion, his resurrection are described with heavenly words and images, with an angelic, an angelic eloquence, while on the other hand so much light is thrown on the mystery of Judas, on the attempt to proclaim Jesus king, on his two brother cousins who do not believe in him. That's a fascinating insight. His brother cousins, you know, the when when Mary comes to Cain, um, uh, when the, 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 that moment in the gospel when they say your mother and your brothers are here, it really op the poem really opens up. Who are these brothers? Who are Jesus's first cousins? It's really incredible. Anyway, on his two brother cousins who do not believe him, on the impression awakened in the Gentiles about him, on his love of the lepers, the poor, the aged children, the Samaritans, and especially on his love so pleasantly and ardent and delicate for his immaculate mother. And not only from the human point of view, but especially a theological one, who can remain indifferent reading the two chapters on the desolation of his most holy mother after the tragedy of Calvary, which revealed to us the co redemptrix had been tempted by Satan and how her redeemer son had been tempted. The sublime theology in these two chapters may be compared to that of so many of the laments of the sorrowful mother. Historical and doctrinal harmony. Exegets today, even Catholics, take the strangest and most daring liberties over the historicity of the Gospels, infancy accounts and the narratives of the resurrection. That's so true. That's so true today. As if, as if with, with form criticism, the redaction criticism one finds the panacea for all difficulties difficulties which were not unknown to the fathers of the church truly to speak only of some recent exegetes uh, Fouard, Sepp, Fillon, uh, Lagrange, uh, Ricciotti on these difficult points they spoke their balanced and luminous words but today there are other masters whom even our own follow which such confidence well then to come back to us i invite the readers of the poem to read the pages consecrated to the resurrection to the reconstruction of events of the day of the pasch and they will ascertain how all is harmoniously bound together there just as so many exegetes who followed the critical historical theological method have tried to do but without fully succeeding such pages do not disturb but gladden the heart of the faithful and strengthen their faith i i think that's amazing i really do i mean you have these so-called biblical scholars scholars who spend decades and decades studying books studying books and here we have christ talking to a bedridden woman giving her, her insight into his life you know and if christ can do this why wouldn't he do this? Especially in this age when we have really destroyed the supernatural reality of of what is written in the gospel. You know, you have people saying, oh no, I don't believe in the resurrection. It didn't happen the way the gospels say. Well, I mean, you had an Irish priest in Ireland saying this. And here you have our Lord saying no. Uh, it's It's really amazing. Anyway, excerpts from a letter of His Excellency Bishop Roman and Danilak, Titler Bishop of Nisa, Rome, Italy, February 13, 2002. 
The nickel obstat and imprimatur, which the Catholic Church's affix, affixes to religious books, was and is a testimonial of the orthodoxy and doc, of doctrine of a given book. It need not necessarily convey the views or convictions of either the delegated priest, theologian, censor who gives his nickel obstat or of the bishop who granted permission to print the book. It is a guarantee that there is nothing against the Christian and Catholic faith or moral doctrine. And for example, Father Marcia, Leader of Christ, his book's got nickel obstats. I'm just saying when you, you know, of course it, it just says that, but what it says, it is to guarantee that there is nothing against the Christian or Catholic faith or moral doctrine. This practice served the needs of the faithful well. There were nonetheless abuses in past history. Yeah, I've, I've seen them. We hear stories of Catholic ecclesiastics, bishops, priests and theologians who would pr proscribe books, nay even order men and women who were accused of heresy to be burned at the stake. We have examples of Joan of Arc and uh, Savonarola, both of whom were burned at the stake on charges of heresy. Then there are stories of the Spanish Inquisition, two other saints, mystics and theologians, St. John, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and blessed now Padre Pio of Petricella were hounded by their ecclesiastical superiors with uh, accusations of heresy, hysteria. In the end, the church acknowledged them as saints. There are similar events of our times. I wish to address the various issues involved with the life and writings of one of these, Maria Valtorta. She was born in Caserta in Italy in 1887 and died in Via Reggio in 1961. She was bedridden from the late 1930s following a mindless attack by a young hood who smashed her back with a crowbar. The Lord accepted her readiness to carry the cross in union with his passion. She became a victim soul. Jesus rewarded her generosity and suffering with boundless graces. She became his an anamnesis. He dictated or unfolded to her the story of his life, death and resurrection, that of his mother and the early church in a series of private revelations which began in 1943 and continued to 1954. With other holy souls, it had suited his purpose to give extreme signs of the stigmata of his passion. He respected the self-facing humility of Maria Valtorta, who asked that the signs of her passion remain invisible to the external world. In the last years of her life, she totally withdrew into herself. Yet her literary productivity in the 12 years between 1943 and 1954 filled many volumes. Maria, faithful to Christ and to his church, was in total obedience to the laws and rules of the Catholic Church. Nothing was printed without ecclesiastical approbation. Notwithstanding this insistence, her spiritual director, Father Migliorani, and the first editor of her works, uh, Michele Pisani, began to divulge fragments of her writings. Three Servite fathers had presented Pope Pius XII, a typed copy of the verse volume of the poem of the man God. The Pope said, let it be published, adding nothing to it, nor taking away anything. Michele Pisani published the first volumes of Valtorta's Life of Christ, the poem of the man God, without the approval of the local bishop. Zealous ecclesiastics brought this to the attention of their superiors. The poem of the man God was placed on the index of forbidden books, not because of doctrinal errors, but because it was printed without the required nickel obstat and imprimatur. The poem of the man God added its title in the current English translation or the gospel as it was revealed to me as it is known in the subsequent Italian editions is now in its fourth Italian edition. It has been translated into many languages. Cardinal Ratzinger in private net letters has acknowledged that the work is free from errors in doctrinal or morals. Doctrine or morals. The Conference of Italian Bishops have acknowledged the same in its correspondence with the current editor, Dr. Emilio Pisani. Pope Paul VI abrogated the institution of the Index of Forbidden Books in 
uh, 65, 66 prior. Approval of writings reporting new revelations is no longer required. The authors and publish, publishers must submit their judgment concerning the alleged revelations to the legitimate judgment of the church without making claims of their truth. This ruling is retroactive to accounts even of earlier revelations if there is nothing contrary to faith or morals. Through a comedy of errors, some of these same ecclesiastics themselves now ignore the rule of canon law and continue to condemn the writings of Maria Valtorta. Um, the big issue here, the big issue is this. Is there anything against faith and morals in her writings? All her critics begrudgingly have acknowledged that there is nothing against faith and morals. The above is somewhat lengthy introduction to my original intent to present a letter of commendation a nickel obstat imprimatur and testimonial to a website of a Catholic monk on the writings of Maria Valtorta. Not only am I saying that there is nothing objectable to the poem of the man God and all of the writings of Valtorta insofar as faith and morals are concerned, I commend a painstaking scholarship of this monk that has brought together an array of writings of a variety of theologians, like Father Karl Ranner, on the significance of private revelation, of countless others who have given testimonies and writings of Maria Valtorta, the theological commentaries on her writings of one of the earlier directors, Father Corrado Berti, the numerous other testimonies and studies on various aspects of Maria's writings. Biblical experts, geographers of the Holy Land, theologians, prelates and scientists, consistorial lawyers who knew and visited Maria Valtorta in her lifetime. He adduces the testimony of Venerable Father Gabriele Allegro, OFM, Biblical Exegete and Missionary and the painstaking scholarship of the present editor and publisher of the works, Dr. Emilio Pisani, who has collated all the arguments pro et contra the writings of Maria Valtorta. This is a website worth visiting www.mariavaltorta.com many times both for these those who have acquired the writings of Maria Valtorta as well as those who have not yet read the life of Christ and the Blessed Mother and that's it